The interesting looking shape that you see on the screen is called the sear Pinsky triangle. And as you can see, it is composed of smaller and smaller triangles. If you ever want to construct such a shape, there are several ways to do it. Though probably the most well known is the top to bottom approach. Start with a full triangle, divide it to four smaller triangles, and then remove the middle one. Do the same with the remaining three triangles, and then again with the remaining nine triangles, and so on. The problem with this construction is that the number of triangles in each step that we need to remember grows exponentially, not to mention that we need to compute the middle of each of them. In this video, I would like to share with you another way to construct the Sierpinski triangle, which is so simple that we can easily change it and get many interesting pictures like the Sierpinski triangle. First, choose a point randomly in the triangle. Next, choose one of its vertices at random and move your point half of the way towards the vertex. From now on, repeat the last step again and again infinitely many times. Choose a vertex at random and move half of the way towards it. You are also allowed to choose the same vertex twice in a row. If you continue this process, then the limit will somehow produce the same Sierpinski triangle as before. As I said before, what is so interesting about this process is that we can easily do it with other shapes. For example, what would you think will happen if we start with the square or the pentagon? Well, let's check. In the square, it seems that we got sort of a uniform distribution of points without smaller squares. While in the pentagon, the image is much more interesting. The distribution changes from one place to the other. There are places totally empty of points, while others become more and more dense. And in any way, it is hard to recognize smaller and smaller pentagons as we had with the triangle. So how exactly does our initial shape controls the final image? To get some more intuition, let us change a little bit our original process. Instead of moving half of the way towards the vertices, let us move even farther, say two thirds of the distance. What do you think will happen this time for our triangle, square and pentagon from before? Now, all the final images seem to be of the same type, which is also of the same type as the Sierpinski triangle. The next natural question is if it is still true if we add more and more vertices. Let us try our new process for 6, 7 and 8 vertices. For 6, it still seems to be of the same type, and we can see smaller and smaller hexagons. But for 7 and 8, the images are a bit more complicated, which reminds somewhat of the results that we got with the pentagon and the half ratio from before. It seems like there is some point in which, if we add too many vertices, the final image changes its type. However, even this is not entirely true. If we rearrange the 8 vertices, in a more square-like shape, and then run our process with the two-thirds ratio, then again we get a very interesting final result. This is a square built up from smaller and smaller squares. If we keep changing the rules, then we can even get more interesting shapes. So what really determines our final image? And more importantly, can we plan ahead the places of the vertices and the ratios in order to get interesting pictures? The goal of this video is to try and understand a little bit of what goes on here and about the mathematics and ideas behind this process. Generally, these type of processes are called random walks, since in each step we choose the vertex at random. These specific random walks in particular are very interesting since it is very easy writing a computer program which simulates them. I actually wrote one myself just for this video, and I added a taste of what you can get just playing around with the rules in another video which I linked below. But for now, trying to understand these shapes, 
we will concentrate on our first image, the Sierpinski triangle. Okay, so our target here is to show that if we take infinitely many steps in this random walk, then in the limit we will get the Sierpinski triangle. But infinity is a lot. A big part of the difficulty and the beauty of mathematics is in this concept. So like with many other problems, the first step is to try and simplify our lives as much as possible. And for that, let us look on the beginning of the process and not on the infinitely many points simultaneously. The first point can be anywhere in the triangle. However, the location of the second point is much more restricted and it depends on the first vertex that we choose. If we play a little bit with the location of the first point, we can see that depending on our first vertex choice, the second point must be inside a smaller triangle. The explanation of this is not very complicated. If we think for a moment, we can see that moving half of the way towards one of the vertices is exactly the same as contracting the big triangle into the smaller triangle near that vertex. Note that we can already see something interesting. While the original triangle is composed of four smaller triangles, somehow our process leaves us only with three of these four. Moreover, these three triangles match our Sierpinski triangle, which we expect to get eventually. On a first glance, it seems that we haven't done too much, but actually we already have a non-trivial result which gives us a way to start understanding this process. Instead of trying to understand the full final image, which is quite complicated, let us simplify the problem again. Suppose that we can't really see the exact location of our points, but only in which of the color triangles they are. Can we say something now? Well, again, the first point can be anywhere in the big triangle, However, the second point will not be in the central small triangle and its chance of being in each of the colored triangles is equal. The triangle containing it corresponds exactly to the first vertex that we choose. How about the cell point? It can no longer be anywhere inside the colored triangles, but we don't care about this right now. We only care about in which small triangle it is. And again, this depends only on the second vertex that we choose. The same is true for any point in every step in our process. Now that we can only see in which color triangle we are, what can we ask? Well, one natural question is to ask how many points there are in each triangle. In our case, there are 3000 points in total and each triangle has close to 1000 points which is of course one third of the total points. This is quite interesting, and we might even conjecture that this is always the case, but there are some issues with this claim. For example, the amount of blue points is almost 100 points away from 1000, and it seems reasonable that the more points that we add, the difference from exactly third of the points in total might grow and even go to infinity. Hence, we need to be more careful with the formulation of our conjecture. Okay, this distance can only grow when we add more and more points, so maybe instead we only need to look at this distance relatively to the total amount of points. In our example of 3000 points, we need to divide by this amount, and as you can see the ratio is very close to one third for each of the small triangles. Since we already have a good guess about the final image, namely the Sierpinski triangle, this claim sounds very reasonable. Indeed, what's special about the Sierpinski triangle is that it is a union of exactly three copies of itself, shrunk down by a factor of two, which are inside our color triangles. Hence, it is very likely that the orbit of the point will spend around third of its time in each of these triangles. Of course, if we make very bad choices, for example, if we keep choosing only the left vertex, then this will not be the case. But the probability that we do such a bad choice is very small, 
since we choose the vertices uniformly at random in each step. This is why the right formulation for our observation so far is that with high probability we will spend around third of the time in each small triangle. This is now a probabilistic claim, which can be proved by using one of the most basic results in probability theory called the weak law of large numbers. Those of you who have already studied probability theory and want to test themselves, what we are using is the following claim, where WI are our choices of vertices. You should stop the video here and make sure that this is indeed what happens and that you understand the connection to the weak law of large numbers. Those who have not yet learned probability, I will not go into it, but let me just say that this is a complicated looking formula which says exactly what we already know. If in each step we choose a vertex uniformly at random, then we expect to see them about the same amount of times. Now that we already have a non-trivial result by studying only the first two points, we can try to get a stronger result by studying the first three points. Again, playing with the location of the first point, we can see that the location of the third point is very limited and can only be inside one of the nine very small triangles according to the vertex choices. For example, choosing twice in a row the top vertex will land us in the very top triangle. If we choose the top and then the right vertex, we will be in the top triangle of the right triangle. Repeating our process from before, we can see that the point spends around one ninth of its time in each of the very small triangles. This is of course also fits what we expect from the Sierpinski triangle, so we can conjecture that this is also true. Fortunately, a slight generalization of our claim from before which uses the weak law of large numbers, can be used now to show that this is also true. We can continue like this to smaller and smaller triangles and get similar results. For every fixed triangle size, our point will spend about the same time in each triangle. Hence, the final image can only be the Sierpinski triangle which satisfies this exact property. It is divided evenly in those triangles. I would like to point out that I have yet to actually define what is the limit of a random process, but in a sense I don't need to. Our goal here, and in general in mathematics, is to study interesting phenomena like this. And usually what we do is to choose the definition so they will fit what we see, because this is what interests us. Once we have the definitions, we can continue and ask what else can we say about them. Now that we have a little bit of intuition, let us look again on some of the examples from the beginning and see what we can say about them. The square is a union of four smaller copies of itself, shrunk down by a factor of two, so like the Sierpinski triangle, we can expect it to be the limit of this process with four vertices. Also, like with the Sierpinski triangle, each smaller square is in itself a union of four even smaller squares, and so on. In the pentagon case, not only that it is not a union of smaller copies, these copies are not disjoint. So the final image is not as simple as we had with the Sierpinski triangle. However, the final image does satisfy our interesting property. It is a union of smaller copies of itself shrunk down by a factor of two. This also explains why for the two-thirds ratio, we got simple results up to six vertices. Up until then, the smaller copies, now by a factor of three, are disjoint. Finally, when we rearranged the eight vertices, we did get an interesting picture. This happened because of the fact that the eight smaller copies of the square are disjoint. Now we get to the interesting part. Can we use our insight so far to create more interesting pictures? We can start, for example, by taking the same decomposition to nine small squares and leave only those on the screen right now. We can also decompose the triangle into nine smaller triangles and leave only the six ones on the screen. 
The problem is that not all of them are shrunk down versions of the original triangle, but we also need to rotate them. But who said that we can only use shrinking down and not rotation in our process? Let us run our process again for this example. Finally, if we want, we can also choose the vertices in a non-uniform manner and get something like this. Of course, there are many other examples and many parameters that we can play with to get new pictures. As I said before, I think that one of the most interesting parts about this process is that you can write a computer program rather easily which can create these shapes. If you do happen to do it and manage to create some nice pictures, I would be happy if you can share a link to them in the comments below. You should also check out the second video that I made with some of the interesting shapes which I managed to create, which I linked in the description below. For the math lovers among you, I also added a link to some notes which goes a little bit deeper into the mathematics behind these random words. So what would you like to know more about this process? And do you have any ideas how to create even more interesting pictures? Please share in the comments below. But for now, you are welcome to enjoy a little bit of a three-dimensional random walk.